Good morning. Um, this is the second uh, uh, lecture of the Stephen Scientific Cervix lecture series. And today I'm going to focus on the adaptive immunity to COVID-19 and I'm going to focus my attention on the messenger RNA lipid nanoparticle vaccines. I'm a uh, professor emeritus at Harvard Medical School. I was at Harvard for nearly four decades. I, at the end of my talk, I'm sure there'll be people who have questions uh, that you can send me an email and I'll do the best I can to, to address whatever point you'd like me to do. My email address is rstevens at richardstevensphd.org. I have two websites uh, if you would like to know more about my basic research over the uh, last 40 years. I suggest you go to that website, namely www.richardstevensphd.org. And the second website refers to the new uh, consulting business that my wife and I created called Stevens Scientific Services. And that website is here, stevensscientificservice.com. Now, before I begin, uh, as a disclaimer, I'm a PhD, I'm not an MD. Thus, there are numerous qu clinical questions pertaining to the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines I can't answer. In those instances, you need to talk to your physician. Now, before I go into uh, um, the COVID vaccines, I'd like to, I have to uh, explain about what immunity is. So uh, in human, there are two types of uh, immunity. There's something called innate immunity, and that appeared about 700 million years ago in evolution. And around the time of C. elegans and fish, around 450 million years ago, uh, that's when adaptive immunity uh, uh, developed. Adaptive is also called acquired immunity. Now, adaptive immunity consists of specialized immune cells, uh, mainly uh, B and T lymphocytes, they're also called B and T cells. And these uh, lymphocytes function by helping us eliminate pathogens. Now, adaptive immunity takes over when an innate immunity is insufficient to control infection. And adaptive immunity is, it differs from innate immunity and in that it educates our immune system and that's defined as immunologic memory. Now it takes uh, a considerable amount of time to develop an effective immune response to a pathogen. And for the two COVID vaccines, we're talking about three to four weeks. Now the COVID messenger RNA lipid nanoparticle vaccines are effective because they activate and educate our adaptive immunity before we encounter the polio uh, coronavirus. Now, both innate and, and adaptive immune response are therefore quickly generated in a vaccinated person who subsequently encounters COVID-19. Before we get to humans, I'd like to go to this uh, more primitive organism. This is the roundworm, uh, C. elegans. And over the last uh, 20, 30 years, uh, many studies have been carried out on C. elegans. And the reason for that, it was felt that if we can understand uh, innate immunity in lower organisms like the, the roundworm, we'd have a better understanding of what goes on in human. Well, uh, the uh, uh, C. elegans, uh, uh, what it does is it feeds off of bacteria and it swims along in, in its environment. And it uses uh, in its head these uh, pathogen recognition receptors to sample its environment. And if the C. This, this elegans uh, likes something as, as it comes in contact, they'll swim towards that, uh, that uh, uh, good food or whatever. However, if the cell, uh, if the roundworm doesn't like a particular food or there's a harmful noxious chemical around, it, uh, the, the receptors in its head will sing, uh, will signal via the nervous system to the tail and the, um, the roundworm will swim away. So um, now, uh, even though th this uh, appeared about 600 million years ago in evolution, it's really interesting that many of the, of the signaling molecules used in um, C. elegans are still uh, uh, used today in humans. And the, uh, it was shown in uh, many years ago that C. elegans innate immune system is also coupled, coupled to its nervous system. And I like this uh, concept because like in C. elegans, 
our immune and nervous system are closely linked. And flight or avoidance is a common uh, human reaction when we encounter a sick person or unhealthy situation. So in a pandemic, pandemic, when a pandemic like COVID-19 starts in a particular place, many of the people try to run away. Uh, so like the C. elegans analogy to uh, escape the infectious organism. Now, moving to humans, as I mentioned, humans have innate immunity and adaptive immunity. And in innate immunity, we have a, a barrier for pathogens, for example, on epithelial surfaces. And if the, if the pathogen can enter our body, we have uh, cells that take up and kill, uh, they're called phagocytes, kill the, uh, the pathogen, wherever it is. We also have a very effective um, a complement system that basically uh, punches holes in uh, bacteria and other infectious agents. And then we have NK cells that recognize uh, uh, defective cells. Now, adaptive immunity is what the COVID vaccines focus on. There's two types of uh, in, in adaptive immunity. There's one that's dependent by B cells or B lymphocytes and other by T lymphocyte. And because uh, this talk is focused on vaccines, what we really care about is the B lymphocyte pathway. Now, because immunologic memory is dependent on adaptive immunity, the focus on combating COVID-19 long-term has been uh, on creating vaccines. Now, we, we know how the body combats uh, bacteria and fungi, via this innate immunity, but less is known about how uh, our cells uh, combat viruses via innate immunity. And this is an area that uh, should be more work done on it uh, because many of the people who are infected with COVID-19 are, are, do not develop any pathology and they're called asymptomatic. And the reason why they're able to fight off the, uh, the uh, coronavirus is because they have a, a very strong innate immunity system. So uh, what is known is that when viruses, RNA viruses like Corona-19 affect our cells, the virus gets inside the host cell, the, the human cell, and there is a protein in that cell called Rig1. Rig1 recognizes the the RNA from the virus, and then that induces the production of, 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 of antiviral factors. Now, there are cells that uh, participate only in innate immunity, and there are cells in our body that participate only in adaptive immunity or predominantly adaptive immunity. But there's one cell that uh, bridges the gap between that, and that's the mast cell. The mast cell appeared about 500 million years of evolution, so way before anything walked on land. Uh, the, these little uh, organisms called sea squirts, they contain mast cells. So, so mast cells have been kept for 500 million years. And they are, are unique in that, as I said, they, they participate in innate immunity and acquired immunity. And innate immunity, they have numerous receptors on the outside surface that can recognize products made by pathogen. For example, bacteria produce a lipid polysaccharide and the toll-like receptors on the mast cell recognize lipid polysaccharide. Now, what happens in uh, the advanced stages of, of COVID-19 pathology, for the example, those people who end up in the hospital, they experience what's called as a, as a complement activation, and, uh, and it generates a cytokine storm. And during complement activation, you generate these two waste products called C3A and C5A, they're called complement anaphylaxis, and the mast cell has receptors on the cell surface that recognize them. And so now it's, it's uh, the, the importance of the cytokine storm that occurs in the very sickest of COVID-19 hasn't been investigated, but I believe it's probably due to activation of the mast cells in the lung and other tissues. Now the mast cell also participates in acquired immunity. And for those who, who, who have bad allergies, you'll know the uh, adverse role the mast cell plays in that. And, and in that case, the mast cell has other types of receptors that recognize immunoglobulins. And they recognize there, there are five types of immunoglobulins. The main immunoglobulin in your body is IgG, and Ig, in certain forms of IgG will uh, activate the mast cell. The immunoglobulin that we're most concerned about 
is IgE. And when you go to get your COVID-19 shot, what's the first thing they ask you? Namely, uh, you tend to, 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 to be allergic to uh, various antigens. And if you are allergic, uh, they will not give you the vaccine. And even to be sure that after you get the vaccine, and so let's say you're not particularly allergic to, to, to uh, various antigens, but once you get the vaccine, what do they do? You, uh, you have to drive to a parking space and you have to sit in that parking space for 15 to 30 minutes. And the reason for that is that we have to check to be sure that you're not undergoing systemic anaphylaxis. So what happens when a mast cell is activated by Ig or complement peptides? The first thing that happens is the, these contents, these secretory granules inside the mast cell uh, get released outside the cell. And on a weight basis, the major constituents of these secretory granules are proteases. But a significant factor is histamine. And histamine is a vasopermeability factor. So what will happen if your mast cells in a particular site, such as your, your the skin uh, up here, degranulate, they, the histamine is released, causes a vasopermeability, and your tissue will swell. Now you can imagine what would happen if the mast cells in your face degranulate, in your heart, in your lung, all over your body. And when that happens, the blood pressure drops like a rock, and uh, you undergo shock, and uh, you can be dead with about 60 seconds, and that's systemic anaphylaxis. About uh, uh, another minute after the mast cells are activated, they will start producing various lipid medias, and I won't go into these today, but it just suffices to know there's leukotrienes and prostaglandins that also are biologically active, released from activated mast cells. Now that's the uh, acute phase of mast cell activation. The delay phase is about four hours later, the, the mast cell uh, creates a cytokine chemokine storm in which over 32 cytokines and chemokines are made. Now, before I turn to uh, COVID-19, I'd like to give a brief history and I'm gonna use two examples where vaccines are uh, ended um, uh, pathogens. Now, the father of vaccines is actually uh, most considered that him to be Dr. Edward Jenner. And uh, in uh, many years ago, uh, uh, the third century BC, they uh, found uh, smallpox like legions on mummies. So smallpox has been around for thousands of years. Now uh, here is the smallpox uh, virus. When this virus uh, in infects you, you get these uh, pox like lesions on your, your hands and, and all over your body. And it's a very deadly disease in the 18th and 19th century. It was estimated that smallpox killed about 400,000 Europeans every single year. And it was smallpox that, uh, that pretty much eliminated uh, the vast majority of Native Americans. So when the Europeans uh, came and settled and, and visited uh, North America, Central America, South America, they brought smallpox with them, which then killed off uh, so many of the, of the Native uh, people. Now, Edward G Jenner uh, he noticed that uh, milkmaids, these women who milk cows, uh, cows had a, a, another type of, of pox, and it was called, uh, by his name, it was called cow, cow pox. And the women who milked those cows by hand picked up that cow pox. And they would go back home and, uh, and the villages, et cetera, and where there, in many cases, a uh, smallpox would be rampant. And uh, so people with smallpox were dying right and left. The women who were, do, who were around these cows didn't get smallpox. And so what Jenner postulate that the smallpox uh, pathogen and the cowpox pathogen are probably closely related. And that the cowpox, if you got infected with that uh, virus, it wasn't known a virus and then, but got infected with that, this virus, that you would then be protected when you subsequently encountered uh, smallpox. So based on that, uh, that was the first uh, vaccination approach to uh, carried out to eliminate uh, smallpox. And due to Jenner's work and others, the last case of smallpox in the world occurred in 1975. So we can use this type of approach to generate a COVID-19 vaccine by giving humans a related but less deadly uh, coronavirus. 
For example, there could be a coronavirus that, that cross reacts to uh, the China COVID-19 that say developed in bats. And by giving the people that, uh, that related virus, we uh, can protect in like in a smallpox, cowpox example. But now moving ahead as I'll go into later in my talk, we don't need to do that. We now have effective uh, viruses that, that are much safer. But having said that, many of those who were infected with SARS in 2003, SARS is a coronavirus, it was the, uh, it came out of China. And if those people survive, they're probably resistant to COVID-19 today, as I'll show you. Now, the other success story in vaccination that I will mention is the polio virus. So in the 40s and 50s, this uh, polio virus was a deadly virus. Uh, the, the mortality rate was not as great as smallpox, but the effects on the on children particularly were devastating. And what this virus did is infected nerves, and especially the nerves that control uh, the uh, uh, feet. And here's a picture taken in the 1950s um, with three children who have polio, and they've uh, basically lost the ability to walk. Now, if the polio virus gets into your diaphragm, it starts to affect the, the muscles that control breathing, uh, you, your risk of mortality increases dramatically. And to get the help for that, uh, people devise these machines called iron lungs, and, and the person would, would go into this and try to help them breathe uh, as they're trying to find out the pathogen. Now the polio virus and by the 1950s was known to be transmitted uh, mainly via the drinking water. So because of that, very few people would swim in public pools in the 1950s and 60s. And in the 1950s, for example, my mother would not let me go to the town pool because of, she was worried that I would pick up the polio virus. Now the breakthrough in the polio story came when the, uh, the Harvard Medical School virologist, John Endes, is a picture of him shown here, and in two postdocs in his laboratory named Thomas Weller and Frederick Ro Robbins, found a way of generating uh, an unlimited supply of polio virus. And what they found is that they could uh, infect culture cells and the culture cells would produce this large amounts of virus. And now once we had all this virus, we can then use it to uh, immunize the world. Now that's where we come along with John Salk and uh, Albert Sabin. And probably many of you uh, have heard of Salk because of the Salk vaccine, the Salk Institute, et cetera. But the reality is these people didn't do that much. They, the one who won the Nobel Prize, as I mentioned, was Enders and his two uh, postdocs in his lab. Now what Salk did is he took the virus that Ender's group made and all he did was he inactivated by exposing the virus, infectious virus, to this chemical formula. And the formalin would uh, inactivate the virus and then he thought this was safe and then uh, he, that was the basis of the, of the so-called Salk vaccine. Now, the problem with this approach and why it was never used, even though uh, Salt got quite famous for it, is that it was uh, technically and logistically extremely challenging because, as you see now in 2021, how difficult it is, is to vaccinate the entire population of America. And, and those who just can imagine what it was like in the 50s when you had to inoculate in a sterile environment. The biggest problem with the salt vaccine is that if you kill 99.99% of the polio virus in the PrEP, that small, small trace 0.01% virus can wreak havoc in the body. And indeed that happened in 1955 when four, 40,000 children were given a preparation that had not been properly treated and they all came down with polio and that, it resulted in 10 deaths. So the bottom line is the salt vaccine, uh, uh, and that, by the way, that was called the, the Cutter incident. And the bottom line is the salt vaccine was not given out uh, to most people in the United States. Now, many of the, those who are reluctant to receive the COVID vaccine today fear a similar government screw up. Now the other virus vaccine, polio vaccine, was developed by uh, 
Albert Sabin in the pictures on the left here. And what he did is he took the virus that Enders, Weller, and Robinson made, and then he exposed uh, different animals and different culture cell systems. And he uh, searched and searched and searched until he finally developed a mutant, spontaneous mutant of the Volley virus in his uh, selection process that stimulated adaptive immunity without causing a paralysis. And this is like the cowpox, smallpox example. Now, the advantage of this vaccine is that it was uh, easy to deliver. And I remember when I was in the third grade, I was marched down to the auditorium and um, we got a little paper cups and the paper cup had a, a lump of sugar. And on top of that sugar was the vaccine, the Sabre vaccine. Now, the danger of this approach, a uh, potential danger, it never occurred, but there was concern that Sabin's attenuated virus would somehow recombine and once again, uh, form the wild type infectious virus. Now, both concerns that occurred in the 50s with the polio vaccine can occur today with the, the messenger RNA uh, vaccines developed by Moderna and Pfizer. And the reason why is because those vaccines only encode one protein, and that's the COVID spike protein. Over 90% of the virus genome is missing in today's vaccines. Therefore, you can never get infectious COVID-19. Now, um, uh, there are many people, uh, estimate about 33% uh, of America now, who uh, do not want to get vaccinated. And they uh, have uh, great fear. And the reason for that is justified, in my opinion. There's uh, some terrible things that have been done over the years that's made people nervous. And I'm just going to use five examples here. So remember, Jenner was a really good guy. He, he basically eliminated smallpox in the world. But even despite that uh, great discovery, he did an unethical experiment. So what he once he formed the hypothesis that cowpox prevented smallpox in a competitive type manner, he tested out his hypothesis using the, uh, the son of, of his gardener. And what he did is he injected that boy with deadly uh, with uh, with uh, cowpox, and then a few weeks later, he then gave him the deadly smallpox. Now, fortunately, the boy didn't develop smallpox. His hypothesis turned out to be correct. Nevertheless, such an unethical and dangerous vaccine experiment wouldn't be allowed today. Salk and Sabin also did unethical approaches in, in their vaccines. So in Salk vaccine, he, uh, he took the virus, he uh, uh, tried to ina inactivate it with the formula, and he injected monkeys, and the monkeys didn't develop uh, polio. So instead of uh, doing more safety controls, he then injected himself and his immediate family with this preparation. And he got no institutional approval for that and no safeguards were put in. Sabin was even worse. Once he got his uh, so-called attenuated polio vaccine, he tested it out in prisoners from a nearby penitentiary. Now, today, you could never uh, uh, do those type of experiments. Now we move to the to the Nazis, as everybody knows, they did ter terrible things to their prisoners, especially the concentra uh, concentration camp Jews. And um, the Nazi physician, Kurt Heismeyer, what he did is he experimented on concentrate concentration camp Jews in a, his attempt to create a, a tuberculosis vaccine. Now, the most, probably the most famous of the unethical experiments uh, carried out in the United States was the Tuskegee Syphilis Experiment Project. Now, uh, in the 1920s and 30s, syphilis was starting to become uh, quite widespread in the United States. And so what the US Public Health Service did in collaboration with the Tuskegee University is they decided to see what was the long-term effects of syphilis on the body. So what they did is they recruited 600 Afro-Americans, men, and 200 of them were, were not uh, affected by syphilis, and 200 of them had the early stages of syphilis. And they promised these 600 men, uh, if they uh, participated in, in this uh, trial, clinical trial, that they would be uh, given health care for the rest of their lives. And uh, so what happened was, was pretty much the opposite. The secret goal, as I said, of this long-term study was to see, evaluate the effect of syphilis on the body. 
Now, shortly after the study was begun, penicillin uh, was found to be effective. And even though syphilis was available, the US Public Health Service uh, failed to give the syphilis infected men the antibiotic. And they went blind, they became insane, and they eventually died. And so people, especially minorities, say, I don't want to get anything which is a government involved because uh, who the heck knows what's going on. So I will say that all the safeguards have been done that I can see with the, the, uh, the vaccines that are now available. And we don't have to worry about that, but I'll go through some of the misconceptions at the end of my talk. So here is two models uh, done, the outside surface and inner part of COVID-19, and this was created by the Center for Disease Control. Now, COVID-19 is a coronavirus, and it's called uh, that because it, when you look at this uh, virus on the electron microscope, you see crown-like projections on the other surface. And these crown-like projections are caused by this protein called the spike protein. And, uh, and then there, there are not many proteins that, that uh, the virus makes, I think it's 29. And so what we want when we make a vaccine, we want to get antibodies to recognize the outside surface of the coronavirus. It wouldn't do any good to make antibodies to recognize internal proteins or epitopes because the antibodies uh, won't be able to get in there. So uh, now that, that the different coronaviruses have been sequenced, the first coronavirus uh, that af affected the respiratory was SARS that appeared in China 16 years ago. And um, in uh, COVID-19, it's a, a distinct uh, coronavirus. But as it turns out, both uh, coronaviruses have a spike protein. And the sequence analysis, we the surprising finding that overall, the, the two spike proteins in the two coronavirus are 76% identical at the amino acid sequence level. And even in, and I'll show you in a few minutes, there are each regions in these spike proteins that are 100% identical. So that information can now be used to generate COVID-19 specific antibodies, as well as antibodies that recognize both a coronavirus and possibly new coronavirus that will appear in the future. Now, this was taken from my first talk, but I'll review it for those who didn't, uh, uh, did not hear that talk. So this is the mechanism of how coronavirus affects uh, human cells, especially human epithelial cells. So what happens is the virus has these spike proteins on its surface. Those spike proteins um, form a trimer complex of three distinct protein molecules. And the spike protein has two domains called the S1 domain and the S2 domain. The S1 domain is the part of the, of the spike protein that recognizes the human uh, epithelial cell. So the human epithelial cells have a receptor on the outer cell surface. It's called angiotensin converting enzyme number two or ACE2. And when a virus approaches the human epithelial cells, it um, comes in contact uh, with the, uh, the receptor that it causes a conformational change in the virus. It pulls it towards the surface. And then the second step occurs. I would, I will say that in most uh, infections are a two-step process. For example, HIV uh, is a two-step process. It binds to a protein called CD4, and then a secondary uh, receptor, uh, chemokine receptor, causes it to be pulled into the cell. And here it's a little bit different, but it's again, it's a two-step process. You get uh, viral binding to, to the ACE2. And then there's this protease, this triptic protease called transmembrane serine protease 2. And that cuts the uh, spike protein at a particular location or in the middle. And that, uh, that uh, triptic type cut results in the internalization of the virus inside the human epithelial cell. So here is what's going on inside the infected uh, human cell. So again, we have the, the COVID-19. It, uh, it recognizes the receptor ACE2 on the surface of, of um, the um, epithelial cell. The triptych protease nicks it, and now that virus is uh, internalized into what's called endocytic vesicle. Now, once the virus gets inside the cell, it basically takes over the machinery of the uh, 
human epithelial cell. So the epithelial cell is no longer making the proteins that it should be making because the virus is uh, uh, taken over. And so the, the virus unfolds. Uh, there's a, a enzyme replicates that replicates the, the genome of the virus to many copies. Some of this method RNA is transcribed, translated, and you end up inducing the human epithelial cells to produce uh, tons of, of the viral proteins. Now these viral proteins assemble and then they get put into these coated, uh, lipid coated uh, vesicles and they move to the cell surface. The lipid, uh, which is this black line, fuses with the plasma membrane and you get release of the infectious particles. So we know now know the mechanism of how uh, COVID-19 and its other, its other uh, coronavirus symptoms work. So how do we uh, immunize the world uh, and to prevent this um, pathogen? And to do that, you need uh, huge amounts of, of the target protein. So again, the, all the vaccines are focused on the spike protein. So one way you do that is you isolate the gene and call it the spike protein. You uh, put it into an expression vector, and then you infect cultured uh, cells, the bacteria or yeast or insect cells, and you trick those bacteria, yeast, and insect cells, so transfected uh, cell, to produce the protein of interest, in this case, the spike protein. And you can grow this up in huge vats to get uh, large amounts of the protein. And then you, uh, what you then do is you isolate and purify the protein of interest. Again, this is the spike protein. And now you can inject that purified uh, coronavirus protein into the relevant mammal to get an immune response. Now, uh, uh, this approach worked. Um, I was done in my lab and many others. Nevertheless, it was uh, done, worked best on a small scale. How were we going to scale this up to, to we can immunize billions of people? Another problem is it was expensive, it was time consuming, and it was technical challenges. Not many people had the technical ability to do this. And another big problem is that one had to get worried about getting rid of the bacteria, yeast, and insects contaminants, because the goal is to generate an immune response against the viral protein, the spike protein, but we don't want to generate uh, antibodies to contaminating bacteria, yeast, and insects contaminants. So the breakthrough came last year when uh, this German company, uh, BioNTech, uh, uh, found a way to create a new type of vaccine, which is called the, the uh, um, messenger RNA lipid nanoparticle vaccines. And the first one that was produced was done by BioNTech and to scale up to, to immunize the, pretty much the world, they formed a relationship with Pfizer and another a company. So uh, these are on the Time Magazine, these are the two founders of the of this uh, company, this very small German company, uh, probably mispronounced the name, but Drs. Sahin and uh, Tursi. Now, while they were working on this uh, problem, Moderna, based in America, uh, used a similar mesoderma-based vaccine approach to create their vaccine. And so these are the two vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines that, that we are immunizing the American public as of today. And the, the, the technology is nearly identical. That what they do is they, they have a, a messenger RNA that encodes the spike protein, and that's encapsulated in these oil capsules, which are known as lipid nanoparticles. Now, Moderna had been working for about a decade on this lipid nanoparticle, so this gave them a, a huge advantage over Pfizer in that their nanoparticles were more stable and did not have to be stored at extreme low temperatures. Now, the third vaccine that's just got approval uh, uh, this week, last week, which still hasn't given out to the population, is the Johnson & Johnson uh, vaccine. And the Johnson Johnson vaccine is, is very different. It, the, the technology of, uh, that, that led to this is uh, due to uh, an adenovirus uh, DNA construct. And at the end of the talk, I can go into that if anybody's interested. 
So here is the uh, slide taken from uh, Moderna that explains how the vaccine works. The same occurs for the Pfizer vaccine. So you have a message RNA here that's put into this lipid uh, droplet. And this message RNA encodes um, the spike protein of COVID-19. And it's a trade secret of what this uh, uh, lipid uh, layer is. There's at least four lipids in there, but um, the companies won't release the exact formula. So now this is uh, put in a syringe, it's injected into the upper arm, and, it will, and once that occurs, some of it will go into muscle cells, and some of it will diffuse towards the uh, lymph node and get uh, taken up by antigen-presenting cells. So if we just focus on the muscle, the, uh, the, uh, the muscle cell um, gets, uh, takes up the, the messenger RNA in the, in the liposome. It, uh, once it gets inside the cell in the cytoplasm, it uh, is recognized by our ribosomes. Ribosomes will uh, make a protein, viral protein, in this case, spike protein, and it gets secreted or presented at the outside surface. Now, the, the uh, spike protein also can be broken down to very small pieces of about eight to, to 10 amino acids, and that can be presented by uh, what's called a major histocompatibility uh, uh, at the regions one and two. And we're just going to talk about the, uh, the B cell because that's what we want. We want antibodies. So what happens is there's a immature B cell, it has a receptor on the cell surface called the B cell receptor that recognizes the viral antigen and it causes the B cell uh, to um, um, uh, undergo maturation and proliferation and finally to produce antibodies. So here again, here's the immature B cell. It comes in contact with the spike protein antigen the B cell uh, matures and uh, proliferates and you get antibodies. Now, as it turns out, there are five antibodies in the body. There's IgA, IgD, IgE, IgG, and IgM. And the first antibody that's produced is IgM. And IgM have uh, in the, uh, this region here highlighted in red is the part that recognizes the spike protein. Now, for mechanisms that's not entirely clear, the heavy chain un genes undergo gene arrangement. So you go from making IgM antibodies to making Ig uh, A, D, G, and E. Okay, and all of them recognize the COVID-19 spike protein, but the heavy chains are very different. And what the goal was of the um, of the two messenger RNA vaccines is to generate good Ig. G, but not bad IgE. And if you make uh, IgE, the IgE can bind to the surface of the mast cell, as I remember I talked about innate immunity and quiet immunity, and that could cause the activation of mast cell, and that would lead to systemic anaphylaxis. So the, one of the reasons why extensive safety trials must be carried out before the FDA, the Food and Drug Admin, uh, Administration, grants approval is because we, want, we need to be sure that the, that the antigen used, in this case, the spike protein, does not lead to production of I, bad IgE. Now, Donald Trump, when he was the president, was furious with the federal drug, drug uh, uh, FDA for not granting approval of the vaccine immediately before the November election. And the reason for that is because it needed to finish the phase three tr clinical trials to ensure that, that, that the vaccine was producing the goal, namely IgG. So this is Moderna's uh, vaccine. It's called the 1273 vaccine. Um, the reason why it's called 1223 is because the, it encodes the entire amino acid sequence of spike protein, which is a 1,273 amino acids. Now, as it turned out, if you compare the amino acid sequence of, say, SARS that appeared 16 years ago with that of COVID-19, you will find regions here that are hypervariable. So wherever there is a solid line, they, there's a identical amino acid, but there are other regions here that are very different amino acids. And so using uh, this approach, this, this uh, uh, 1273 antibody, some of the antibodies that you will make are against this hypervariable region of COVID-19, and those antibodies will not 
recognized SARS. But fortunately, the company decided to not focus on this region, but focus on the entire protein. And the entire protein, overall, the amino acid sequence identically is 76%, but there are regions shown here that are 100%. So if you made an antibody to against a small uh, sequence in this one, the antibody will definitely cross-react with SARS. So, it, the, so the first thing is it's likely that Moderna vaccine will predict will protect against most new strains of COVID. Okay, possibly not all, but at least most of them. Now people are nervous about um the uh, safety of these vaccines. And so to deal with that, the Food and Drug Administration makes uh, drug companies go through extensive what's called clinical trials. And every uh, drug needs to go three phases of clinical trials. And the first one is, is called the safety trial. And what uh, Moderna did is identify 45 healthy uh, um, uh, adults who are 18 to 55 years old they were inoculated twice, four weeks apart, with the uh, with three different doses. So, fifteen people got twenty five micrograms, fifteen people got hundred micrograms, and uh, fifteen got two fifty. And uh, they then waited uh, weeks later, and then they looked to see what happened. And, and the first thing, hundred percent of the people develop immune response to the uh, the antigen, which was which was great. So all the people that were vaccinated were producing antibodies that recognize uh, COVID-19 spike protein. The other uh, fortunate thing, there was no uh, trial of any safety concerns identified. So based on that success, and this happened in both vaccines, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine, they went into the phase two and phase three clinical trials. And Moderna's uh, second clinical trial that consisted of 300 adults who were 18 to 55 years old. And they also looked at uh, 50 additional adults who were 56 to 70 years old. They uh, did this, they picked the middle dose, they gave the people uh, 100 micrograms of the uh, vaccine and they waited a month uh, later and they gave them the second dose. And because the trials were working out so well, they immediately went into the phase three trial. Now the phase three trial is the full blown test. This is a randomized observer blinded placebo controlled trial vaccine carried out at 99 centers. So if there was one center that didn't know what they're doing, we still had another eight, 98 centers to evaluate the data. And so what they did in the phase three trial is they gave uh, 15,210 volunteers two injections of the 1273 vaccine, 28 days apart. Another 15,200 received the placebo. And the endpoint was prevention of COVID-19 illness. So the first thing that was learned is that these uh, vaccines are really quite safe. And the reason that what happens is when you uh, give someone a a shot, if they have a bad reaction, they're not going to come back and get the second shot. And all the people came back to get the second shot. And the most amazing thing is that 94% of, of, of effectiveness at preventing COVID-D. Now in seasonal flu, the vaccines we get for seasonal flu are only effective at about a 40 to 60% level. And here we had a vaccine that was, uh, that was effective at 94%. The other thing is that there was a very few uh, serious adverse uh, reaction. There was some transient local and systemic reaction, but no safety uh, concerns were identified. So based on the, the data from the phase one, phase two, and phase three clinical trials, that data was uh, analyzed by an independent group of, of investigators. Uh, I think it was 21 experts at the Food and Drug Administration, and they gave uh, a, a emergency use authorization from Moderna's 1273 vaccine on 18th December. And now moving ahead uh, uh, a couple months, we've now, uh, as I'll show you, immunized millions of Americans against the, with this vaccine and this related Pfizer one. Now as the current situation of February 26, 47 million Americans have received either Moderna's or Pfizer's vaccine with another 20 million receiving both doses. Now I'd like uh, to focus on some of the misconceptions that people have that's preventing them from taking these vaccines. 
And I'm gonna give you 15 of them. There might be another 15, but these are the ones that occurred to me. The first one, the first misconception, well, I don't wanna take the, the COVID-19 vaccine because they aren't safe. They were rapidly developed and not thoroughly tested. Well, as I showed you, that wasn't true. Uh, both uh, vaccines went through three clinical trials. And uh, the Moderna one, for example, was uh, over 15,000 people were in that trial. But more important now, we've now immunized more than 47 million Americans. So we're long be past this rapidly developed, not thoroughly tested. Uh, very few adverse side reactions have been found. The second misconception, the creation of these methadone vaccines were initiated when, when Donald Trump was the president of the United States. And because Trump told so many lies, I don't trust him or, or his administration. And indeed, uh, Vice President Harris, when she was uh, running in the November election, she was asked, would you take the, um, the, one of these viruses? And she said that, well, if Donald Trump told me to take it, I won't trust anything he says, and therefore I'm not taking it. So the first thing I need to point out is that it was true that these vaccines were in the final stages of development when Trump was the president of the United States. And he, but having said that, he and his task force had nothing to do with the creation of the Pfizer biotech vaccine. And Pfizer and a German partner developed the max, their mesoderma vaccine without final financial assistance from the United States. And I believe the reason why that was done is because Pfizer wanted to, to market the vaccine to, uh, to the world, and they didn't want to have any restrictions placed on them, whether they could only give it to America's citizens first. And the, uh, the other thing to be noted is that the only a very few Americans uh, were vaccinated uh, uh, before Trump left office. Remember the the uh, uh, approval for the Moderna was given on December 8th and, then, and, um, and Trump did not leave office from the, the middle of December, uh, January. <clears throat> the third misconception, the COVID message RNA these vaccines can create an overreactive immune response that are more helpful than benefit. And this was a, a concern when the clinical trials were started because we, the goal was to make uh, IgG antibodies that, that neutralized the coronavirus, but there was a remote possibility that some people would generate a life-threatening systemic anaphylaxis because they made IgE responses. And fortunately, with the, the uh, there's now 47 million Americans who have received the first vote, but 64 total of vaccine doses have been given out because some of 20 million have gotten both, and the uh, the IgE responses are particularly rare. Uh, but even saying that, uh, when you go uh, to get your vaccine, what's, what do they do? They force you to go into a rest area for 15 to 30 minutes. And uh, if you are, are developing a bad reaction, which is pretty much always uh, systemic anaphylaxis, you have to flash your lights and honk your horn so someone can uh, deal with that situation. The fourth misconception. Well, the mammalian protein ACE, that's it's now known that that's the primary receptor for COVID-19 spike protein. But ACE is expressed in the testes. And so people were concerned that the vaccines might cause infertility or some kind of birth defects. Well, that can't occur. First off, the COVID-19 was not injected, into, is not injected in the testes of the uterus, it's injected in the upper arm. And these uh, uh, vaccines do not uh, uh, produce infectious viral particles that can move to, the, to any part of the organ. So, and finally, more important, decreased fertility was not seen in the clinical trials and birth defects also did not occur in those vaccinated women who suddenly gave birth. Another misconception, I don't want to take these COVID-19 vaccines because they must be extorted at extremely low levels. Maybe they have something harmful in them, some preservative or any other compound. Well, th this is wrong. Neither vaccine has a preservative. The reason why they have to be stored at a very cold temperature is because they have messenger RNA in them. And messenger RNA is very fragile. And uh, so you have to store that in a very cold temperature to prevent um, their breakdown. 
the six misconception. I should get a COVID vaccine because I'm allergic to eggs. Well, eggs are used in uh, other types of vaccine, but they're not used in these message RNA vaccines. Uh, nevertheless, as I pointed out, there's still a, a, as a precaution, those given the master RNA vaccines, I encourage you to remain at the inoculation center for 15 to 30 minutes for routine observation. The uh, seventh uh, uh, concern for those who believe in right to life uh, is that, it, is it possible that the, I don't want to take these vaccines because they were developed using fetal tissue? Well, uh, there, uh, that might be somewhat of a problem with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, but it wasn't a problem with the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Neither vaccines contain human fetal cells, nor were human fetal cells used in their development and production. Misconception eight. The coronavirus vaccines were developed to, to control the general population, either through a microchip tracking system or nanotransducers in our brain or some other uh, Q&A type uh, 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 misconception. Now, I'm not quite sure what led this misconception. Uh, it, it is some feeling that Bill Gates contributed to it because what Bill Gates did is he reported creation of a digital certificate of vaccine records so we could find out how many people have been vaccinated, who has received one vaccine or, or both shots. Anyway, if that's what happened, his comments were misinterpreted. There is no vaccine microchip. And the vaccines don't track people or gather information in any type of database. Misconception number nine, more people will die of the adverse side effects of COVID-19 than who would actually die from the coronavirus. And uh, college students are known to be resistant to uh, pathology, so they don't need to be vac vaccinated. Well, the risk of a, of a COVID-19 infected person who is 20 years old requiring hospitalization is fivefold less than one of 65. But that statistic doesn't take into account those young Americans who have a pre-existing health condition. Now, having said that, the primary reason why Americans you, who are young need to get vaccinated is because asymptomatic infected people can still spread the disease. Now, while some vaccinated people develop mild systems, symptoms as their immune system responds, adverse reactions are rare and not for long. The bottom line is uh, eventually everybody in America will be vaccinated. Misconception number 10, I don't need to wear a mask after I get vaccinated for COVID-19. Well, uh, here uh, we don't have an answer for you on that. The Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, they reported it takes about three to four weeks for a vaccinated person to develop optimal immunity. So if you get your first vaccination shot or even your second, you, uh, you still could be infectious for that window of time. Now it might take six months for every American who wants a COVID-19 to get one. And presently we don't know how long an immunized protect person is protected. Now, while the vaccines are working in preventing people from getting extremely sick, it's not, it's unknown if a vaccinated per person still can transmit the infection virus to others. And finally, it's not known if these vaccines will protect against new strains of COVID-19. So the bottom line is until more is known about how they work, mask wearing and physical distancing is still advised. Misconception number 11. There are severe side effects of these COVID-19 messenger RNA. And the answer is that was a concern uh, two months ago, but now 67 million doses of the vaccine have been given out to 47 million people, and uh, there is no uh, severe adverse reaction been seen. The next uh, question, the messenger RNA in Moderna's and Pfizer's uh, vaccine will, might alter my genome. Now, this is a concern for Johnson & Johnson's adenovirus DNA vaccine, but it's not a concern for Moderna's and Pfizer's vaccine. In the latter two vaccines, the message RNA in the vaccine stays in the cytoplasm of the human cell. Because it can't enter the nucleus where our genes reside, it can't alter our, our genome. Misconception number 13. I already had COVID-19 and I recovered. I therefore don't need to get a COVID-19 uh, vaccine. 
That's not correct. There's just simply not enough information to say if or for how long someone is protect, protected from getting COVID-19 again. Of concern, a person could have been affected with COVID-19 uh, six months ago and were able to fight off the, the pathogen virus uh, innate, uh, that person's innate immunity. But now moving ahead, that person becomes a, uh, exposed to another COVID-19 affected person. They uptake more of the virus into their lungs and uh, they're not protected because, the, uh, because they never identified and they never generated antibodies to the virus. The vaccination protocol assures that won't happen, thereby minimizing the chance of a second infection. And the last two misconception. Well, I don't want to take the message RNA because maybe they'll give me uh, some disease as what happened with Salk's polio vaccine preparations. This cannot occur. The reason why is the COVID-19 genome encodes 29 proteins. All 29 of those proteins are needed to inject, uh, to generate an infectious virus. The messenger RNA only encodes one protein, namely the spike protein. Thus, there's no way you can generate an infectious virus in the two COVID-19 messenger RNA approaches. The last uh, conception goes back to that uh, that syphilis experiment carried out in the 1930s. Now, substantial health disparities exist in the United States. We all know that. And so the a minority community, especially the Black and Hispanics, are concerned that maybe the vaccine given to white Americans is safer and somehow more effective than the vaccine given to Black and Hispanics. And they also worry about the Pfizer vaccine in a similar way. Now, this is incorrect. The messenger RNA vaccine from Moderna and also from Pfizer is the same. And um, so, be, but more importantly, because if Blacks and Hispanics are more, <clears throat> are more likely to divide, develop life and threatening pathology when they are COVID affected, that's why it's particularly important for those ethnic groups to get vaccinated. Now, I'm sure there'll be many questions about my talk, and I tried to guess what those uh, most of those questions will be, and um, I, I've formulated the nine questions shown here. So many people will ask me, how long will each messenger RNA vaccine protect us from developing moderate to severe pathology without getting a booster shot? The answer here is simply we don't know. There are people who went through the, uh, the phase one to three clinical trials six months ago, and they're still protected. So it's likely that the antibodies will protect for at least six months. Will they protect us for six years or 60 years? We don't know that. And uh, related to that, what's the half-life of the generating antibodies in our body? We don't know that. Uh, third question, do the vaccines promote the generation of long-lasting memory B cells? We don't know that either. So what what the, the vaccines do is they induce uh, um, immature B cells to, to undergo maturation and to um, proliferate and to produce antibodies. But there are these cells called memory B cells that last for years and years that, that can be expanded uh, if we get a secondary infection, say 10 years from now. And we don't know yet if the, the mast RNA vaccines affect, uh, induce Memory B cell. Next question. Will these vaccines become as effective in children as they are in adults? Again, we don't know. The danger uh, uh, when the, before the clinical trials was the elderly. So therefore, all the attention was to see the effectiveness and safety in the adult population. Now the companies have to go back and look to see uh, what's going on with children. Uh, sixth, uh, question number five, how go good would these vaccines be against new strains of COVID-19? There is a, a big concern by that, but based on the example I gave for the 1273 vaccine, there are regions that are 100% uh, conserved. And so I'm betting that the, um, the, the vaccines, uh, the antibodies, first off, 
when you take the mass RNA, you're not generating one antibody, you're generating hundreds of antibodies. And some of those antibodies recognize uh, uh, the hypervariable region of, of the spike protein, but many of them re recognize the conserved domain. And so those antibodies will, should react against all strains coming down the pike. So uh, in regard to the same question, SARS and COVID-19 spike protein have numerous amino acid sequences which are 100% uh, identical. Thus, the uh, question is, can COVID-19 vaccines somehow protect us against SARS and any new coronavirus that appears in the future? Again, this remains to be determined. I think a bigger factor will be how long do the, do the antibodies last on the circulation. But the evidence so far is that they will be protective. Now, this is such a new technology, only appeared uh, this year. Can the messenger RNA lipid technology be used to create effective and long vaccine vaccines against other deadly viruses, such as HIV and Ebola? And again, this is an exciting area, of, of, but it's a future investigation. Now, the two vaccines need to be stored in cold temperature. So, uh, an interesting question, can a better lipid combination be found that improves the vaccine stability? And the companies are working, I'm sure, quite hard on that question. The best in our lipid vaccination protocol that's being currently being used is a two-step, you get the first shot, and then four weeks later, three to four weeks later, you get the second shot. And the question is, will only one shot be needed in the future? And that is the goal, but right now we're left with a, a two-step uh, vaccination protocol. Well, in January 12th uh, of this year, the Center for Disease Control decided that airline passengers who want to enter the United States from a foreign country need to get COVID-19 tested uh, at least no more than three days before their flight depart. And then they need to sh show proof that they are not infected and before they can actually board that plane. If they don't do that, it's mandatory that it became quarantined for two weeks. Now, America is not the only country doing that. All, pretty much all the countries will do that shortly. So now if I'm uh, living in Miami and I want to go to Italy for a vacation uh, and I decide I don't want to get the vaccine, once I get into Italy, um, say I'm going to Venice, the Italian government will make me uh, back being quarantined for two weeks. So there I will, I'll sit in my hotel for two weeks, not being able to go to restaurants, not being able to, to go in the gondola, et cetera. So the bottom line is it, based on that decision, it's only a matter of time before, because, before it becomes mandatory that those who want to enter another country document their vac been vaccine, vaccinated. And I wouldn't be surprised if a few years from now, if you want to get on an airplane from in New York and you want to fly to uh, Miami and Florida, you'll have to prove that you've been vaccinated. Now, uh, when I was first asked to give this uh, talk, uh, about 50% of America uh, did not want to be vaccinated. And uh, while the situation improved dramatically in the last couple of months, still about 33% of the country's doesn't want to receive the vaccination. So my advice to everybody who's listening to this talk, unless it's an extenuating circumstance. So for example, a person who tends to produce IgE to antigens, everybody should get the Moderna of, of Pfizer's best known vaccine when given a chance. Five, over 500,000 deaths occurred. And those are in America alone. And that's not counting the millions of people who who've been infected, who apparently recovered to the point where they can actually leave the hospital, but for a long time that they st still have uh, substantial problems. And those are called the uh, COVID-19 long haulers. So we don't want to get infected and uh, get the vaccine. Now, the third vaccine uh, has recently been approved. It's the Johnson Johnson adenovirus vaccine. Now, the one advantage of the Johnson Johnson vaccine is that you only have to get one shot. Now, having said that, that is a big advantage. I personally prefer not to get the J&J &J adeno, uh, adenovirus. And the, late, the, the, the Johnson Johnson vaccine is not as effective as the Moderna 
and the Pfizer vaccine. They're not getting 95% protection. And more of a concern, the, this, the technology is very different. There's a DNA sequence and that gets incorporated into our genome. And finally, there's no uh, uh, long-term uh, evaluation of the safety of the Johnson Johnson vaccine. 47 million Americans have already proven the safety of the Mastrani vaccine. The bottom line, the Mastrani vaccines are more effective and possibly safer. Now, it's presently unknown how long the three available vaccines protect us from COVID-19. If it eventually turned out that the J&J vaccine protected us longer, it would be a better vaccine. Unfortunately, half-life of the three vaccines in a body haven't been determined. Well, that concludes uh, my presentation. As I said, that I'm sure many in the audience would be, uh, have questions. I gave you my email address. Feel free to send me an email and I will try to answer your question. If I don't know the answer, I'll try to find the re relevant person that you can talk to. So thank you for listening to this talk. This talk will be posted on uh, my website, Stephen Scientific Services, as the, will the other talks, that, lectures that I will give.